In our church, we sing psalms only. Why is that? Is it just a tradition? Is it just that we're old-fashioned? We always did it that way, so we continue to do it that way. Is it simply a preference that we have? No, it is not. We sing psalms only because we believe that that is what God wants us to do. And so tonight, what I would like us to do is to look at <coughs> some of the arguments in Scripture for the singing of psalms only to show why we are compelled to sing the psalms. It's not a choice. It's not a tradition. It's not that we're old-fashioned. It's that we believe it is a biblical principle. So what I'd like to do tonight is to give 20 reasons why we sing psalms only in public worship. And what we're talking about here is not what we might do in our homes or in our own, but rather what we do in public worship. So I would, would like to uh, set before you some 20 reasons why we should only sing psalms in public worship. Now, first of all, the basic reason is, of course, the regulative principle of worship. What does that mean? Regulative principle of worship? It means that God tells us how to worship him. And God is so great and powerful and glorious that he has a right to tell us how to worship him. It's not up to us to say, well, we like worshiping him in this way and we want to worship him in that way. No, God tells us how to worship and our duty is to follow the directions that he gives in his Bible. Now, the Lutherans and the Anglicans, they have a different principle when it comes to this. They say that you can worship God any way you like, providing it's not forbidden in Scripture. No, we should worship God not any way we like, providing it's not forbidden. We should worship God the way God tells us to worship him, the way God commands us to worship him. God set out very clearly his laws to Moses many years ago on Mount Sinai. <clears throat> he set out the pattern for Old Testament worship. And he said to Moses, see that you do all things according to the pattern given to thee in the mound. Aaron, his brother, was the high priest. Aaron's two sons, Nadab and Abihu, were priests. They thought they would come along and worship God with some extra ideas of their own. They came with strange fire. You remember what happened. They died. God killed them because they came with strange fire. They came with their own ideas in worship. It wasn't something that God had forbidden that they did. It was something that they invented themselves. God doesn't want our inventions. He says, see that you do all things according to the pattern. And that command that was given to Moses in Exodus chapter 25 and verse 40, it's repeated again for us in Hebrews chapter 8 verse 5. See that you do all things according to the pattern. Not what pleases us, not what makes us feel good, not what attracts the crowds. We've got to remember God is holy, God is great, God is infinitely majestic, and God tells us how to glorify him, how to please him, how to worship him. 
Worship is serious. We must not trample God's courts. We must not treat God's house irreverently. We come before God in the fear of God. And God commands us to worship him by singing psalms. We have that in Psalm 95, verses 1 and 2. We'll be singing this later on in our service. Psalm 95, and verse 2. Let us come before his presence with praise and thankful voice. Let us sing psalms to him with grace and make a joyful noise. God commands us to sing psalms. Earlier in our service, Psalm 105, we sang verses 1 and 2 with the same command is given to sing psalms. 1 Corinthians 14, verse 26. Again, psalms being sung. One comes with a psalm to the worship of God. It was psalms that were sung in the early New Testament worship. So, the regulative principle. What does God command? He commands us to sing psalms. Now, the second reason is the command that is given in the very verse in front of us. Here we are told, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. We are to sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. Now, what is meant here by psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs? Well, we know what psalms are, don't we? Yes, book of psalms. What about spiritual songs? Some people think that spiritual songs means religious songs. But the word spiritual is never used in the Bible in the sense of religious. It's used 25 times of the Holy Spirit and once of an evil spirit, spiritual wickedness. Every other case, in the 25 cases, it's of the Holy Spirit. So what we have here is Holy Spirit songs. What are Holy Spirit songs? Songs inspired by the Holy Spirit. The third person of the Trinity speaking through an individual. And where do you find these spiritual songs, these spirit-inspired songs? They're only to be found in the Bible. No hymn writer can claim to be inspired by the Holy Spirit. So psalms mean the psalms in the Bible, and spiritual songs must mean the songs in the Bible. So what are the hymns? Surely the same. And indeed, when we go to the Greek translation of the Old Testament, the Old Testament was written in Hebrew, and then as the world became more Greek-speaking, it was translated two, three hundred years before the coming of Christ. It was translated into Greek, the Septuagint. And in the Septuagint, you find the various titles to the Psalms. Not all the Psalms have titles, but some do. And of these titles, 67 have the title Psalms. Six have the title Hymns. And 35 have the title Songs. So what we have in the book of Psalms are Psalms, Hymns, and spiritual songs. And indeed, that word spiritual qualifies them all. They're all spirit-inspired. Why do we sing psalms in our public worship? Because we are commanded to sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. And that refers to the book of psalms, not to our uninspired contributions, not to the songs we might think up or the hymns that certain hymn writers might, write, might compose. We are commanded to sing psalms. So that's a second reason. The third reason is also to be found in this verse. Verse 16, we're told, 
Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom. The word of Christ, singing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. What's the word of Christ? The word inspired by Christ. The word that Christ has written for us. Now, Christ is a great prophet. And the spirit of Christ was the spirit in the prophets. And Christ spoke through the prophets and spoke through the scriptures. And the word of Christ is the Bible. From Genesis to Revelation, it's all the word of Christ. The word of the great prophet. Think of 2 Peter 1, 21. There Peter speaks of scripture. Holy men of God speak as they were moved by the spirit. Those who authored the scriptures, who wrote it, they were carried along by the Spirit. What Spirit? The Spirit of Christ. Let the word of Christ dwell in you. That's another reason. Our songs in church are to be the word of Christ. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly teaching and admonishing one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts. A fourth reason is that we're told here to teach and admonish one another. Now, what are we to use for teaching and admonishing one another? Are we to use the writings of uninspired men? Surely not. The only rule to direct us how to glorify and enjoy God is the Bible. The Bible is unique. The Holy Scriptures, it's special. It's the rule to guide and direct. It's inspired. It's infallible. You know, when you come to the hymn writers, two of the greatest hymn writers we can think of, Isaac Watts, He didn't believe in the Trinity. And he didn't believe in total depravity. Charles Wesley, another great hymn writer, was an Arminian who didn't believe in election and in irresistible grace. These men were heretics, and yet so many churches today are using their songs How are we to teach one another? What songs should we use in teaching one another? Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your heart to the Lord. We're to teach one another with infallible scripture, with a Bible. So that's a fourth reason A fifth reason is that God has given us 150 hymns. He's given us a book in the Bible with all these songs. So why should we come along with other songs? This is not a terrible thing to ignore and despise the great songs that God has given us as so many people do in churches today. We don't have in the Bible a book of prayers, so we don't read our prayers. We compose our prayers as we pour out our hearts to God. We don't have in the Bible a book of sermons, so we compose our sermons. But we have in the Bible a great book of songs. God gave it to us. And he said, sing psalms. So let us sing psalms in our worship. God has given them to us. So that's another great reason. A sixth reason is that the New Testament worship started in the synagogue. When Paul went to a new place, a new city, he would go first to the synagogue. And there in the synagogue, he would join with the Jews. And what did they, how did they worship God in the synagogue? They sang psalms. They said prayers. 
They read the scriptures and they preached the word. And Paul would join with them and he would preach there and he would be with them until they rejected him and threw him out. That was the pattern for the New Testament church. And when they threw him out, he would continue to do what he had been doing before. Reading the scriptures, preaching the scriptures, saying prayers to God and singing the psalms. That was the pattern laid down. They sang psalms in the early church. They followed the pattern laid down in the synagogue. And so we should follow that same pattern which Paul and the apostles also followed. A seventh reason is that Jesus taught us to worship him in spirit and in truth. Remember how Jesus met the woman at the well of Samaria. And the woman said to them, well, where is it right for us to worship? We built this temple at Mount Gerasim. You Jews say that you should worship God at the temple in Jerusalem, which is right. And Jesus said, the day is coming when you shall neither at this temple nor yet in Jerusalem worship the Father, but you shall worship him in spirit and in truth. The temple, temple worship was very different. It had sacrifices, it had elaborate um, procedures, all these things were symbolical and typical and they were pointing forward to Christ who is our New Testament temple. Destroy this temple and in three days I will build another, he said. And he was referring, of course, to his own body raised from the dead. He would be the New Test Testament temple. The temple worship was grand, elaborate, uh, pictorial and full of types. It passed away with the death of Christ. And so we're not to worship in any temple today. But wherever the two or three are gathered together in his name, they're worshiping God. And that's how we are to come together and worship God. And when we worship, Jesus says, we're to worship in spirit and in truth. And worship in the Holy Spirit and with the truth. And what is the truth? The Bible is the truth. We've been given the truth. Let us worship God with psalms which are the truth. They are inspired, infallible, inerrant. We worship God in spirit and in truth. So that is another reason for worshiping with psalms. And then an eighth reason is that no songs can compare with the Psalms. The Psalms are different. They're special. They're on a different level. There's no error in the Psalms. They are infallible, inerrant, inspired by the Spirit. They are perfect. And how dare we place our fallible contributions, our fallible songs beside the infallible psalms of God. The psalms of Scripture are incomparable, as different from human hymns as heaven is from earth. They are the very word of God. So that's another reason. They are incomparable. A, sec, uh, a ninth reason is that the Psalms are new covenant songs. Now I was shocked uh, a month or two back to notice in the Evangelical Times an article, an article about uh, Charles Wesley. And the writer there said he praised Watts and Wesley 
for breaking the exclusive samadhi that had been practiced up till now, up till that point. Watts and Wesley got people to move away from the sands. For the superior, as he put it, new covenant praise that you get in the hymns. I was shocked at that. So the Psalms, he said, are not new covenant praise. I found that very sad. You know what Paul said about the Old Testament scriptures? The scriptures which include the Psalms, the scriptures which Timothy had known since his childhood, that is the Old Testament scripture, to Timothy 3.16. All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for instruction and righteousness, that the man of God might be truly furnished unto all good works. He's referring to the Psalms. He's referring to the whole Old Testament. The Old Testament isn't some second-rate scripture. It's perfect scripture. We're to preach from it. We're to read it. We're to study it. We're to sing it today because it's all new covenant. Yes, it was written in old covenant times, but now Christ has died and risen again and through understanding with the fullness that we get in the New Testament, the key that we have, we read the Old Testament with new eyes, with new understanding. And the Psalms are new covenant Psalms. They're not some old covenant Psalms that can be thrown to one side for our superior hymns by Watts or Wesley. Oh no. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for teaching, for instruction, for reproof, instruction in righteousness, instruction in the gospel, instruction concerning the Savior, instruction concerning justification by faith alone and sanctification and all the great truths of the atonement And of the gospel, they're all there in the Old Testament as well as in the New. The Psalms are new covenant songs, and so we are to sing them. They're wonderful scripture praise. The tenth reason is that all the Psalms are messianic. They're all about Christ. Now, some Psalms are talked about as messianic, and it's more easy to see how they are messianic. For example, Psalm 22 or Psalm 69. Psalm 22, which begins, My God, my God, why hast thou me forsaken? And Christ quotes these words as he is dying on the cross at Calvary. But all the Psalms are about Christ. Why do we say that? Well, Jesus says, John 5, 39, Search the scriptures, for these are they that testify of me. All the scriptures speak about Christ. From Genesis to Malachi to Revelation. Christ is on every page of scripture. And every chapter, every verse, we are to see it in the light of Christ. It's all pointing to Jesus. In the Roman Empire, all the roads led to Rome. In the scriptures, every verse leads to Christ. All the Psalms are messianic. Remember when Jesus, after his resurrection, met with two on the road to Emmaus. And he began to explain to them how Christ had to die and rise again. They thought it a great disaster that Christ had died, but it wasn't. It was a glorious achievement, a fulfillment of the Old Testament. 
beginning at Moses and the prophets. He explained to them in all the scriptures concerning himself. And their hearts burned within them as the light of Christ shone on the Old Testament scriptures. All the Psalms are speaking to us in different ways about Jesus Christ. That's why we're to sing them. They're all messianic. Jesus is on every page. He's the subject of every one of these Psalms. And the 11th reason is that Jesus sings the Psalms with us. The Bible actually tells us that. <coughs> Think of Psalm 22, I've just mentioned it, where Christ says, My God, my God, why hast thou me forsaken? Why so far art thou from helping me and from my words that roaring are? Upon my vesture lots they clasped and clothes among them share. So on all that psalm, as bulls they compass me about, the wicked that at meet in their assembly me enclosed, they pierced my hands and feet. And then we read verse 22 of Psalm 22, I will declare thy name in the midst of the congregation. I will praise thee. What is Christ doing? He's singing Psalm 22. He's praising in the midst of the congregation. Jesus sings the Psalms. Take another Psalm, <clears throat> Psalm 69, 69, another Psalm that speaks about the suffering of Christ. The zeal of thine house hath eaten me up. Well, that's quoted in John's Gospel, chapter 2 as referring to Christ. The zeal of thine house hath eaten me up. They gave me vinegar to drink when as my thirst was great. Who's speaking there? Again, it's Christ given vinegar to drink on the cross. And then verse 30. Praise God with a song. And magnify his name with thanksgiving. Praise God in a song. You see, Jesus inhabits the praises of Israel. He sings the Psalms. He sings them with us. And as we sing, he's singing in heaven. You know, when we pray, we have Christ praying with us in heaven before his Father. And when we sing the Psalms, Christ is singing the Psalms with us. They're his Psalms. They're about him. And he's leading the choir, as it were. He's singing the praises. He's singing the psalms in heaven. When you sing the psalms, you're singing Christ's words. And you're singing them with him. He's the great presenter. In Matthew 26, verse 30, we're told that at the end of the Passover meal, that Jesus sang a hymn with his disciples and then went out to the Mount of Olives and the Garden of Gethsemane. All the commentators tell you that this, the hymn which they sang was Psalm 118, called the Hallel. It was always sang. It was always sung at the Passover. Psalm 118, Christ leading his disciples, singing the Psalms. Christ sang them in the synagogues. Christ sang them with his disciples when he celebrated the last proper Passover and the first communion. He sang Psalm 118. A twelfth reason is the Psalms give great insight into the thoughts and feelings of Christ. We're told many things about Christ in the Gospels, but you can learn many things about the thoughts, the pressures, the stresses, the desires, the, see, the, the sighs, the yearning of Christ from reading the Psalms. The Psalms give us an insight into the very thoughts of Christ. A thirteenth reason is that the Psalms are richly experimental or 
as we put it sometimes, um, experiential. They talk about our Christian experiences. Calvin described the book of Psalms as an, an anatomy of every part of the, of the human soul, an anatomy of the soul. It, it leads us into an understanding of our Christian experience. How often you and I, reading the Psalms, singing the Psalms, have found our experience there and found comfort and encouragement. How many people have come to assurance of salvation in singing the Psalms? It was like that with me personally. One night, singing Psalm 116, God spoke to me through that psalm. And I got assurance of my salvation. Thankfully an assurance which has never left me. The Psalms are God's word. They're richly experiential. They are such a blessing to our souls. Going through dark waters in deep troubles. The troubles that afflict the just and number many be, but yet at length out of them all the Lord hath set him free. How many encouraging psalms there are, whatever we're going through. Oh, why art thou cast down, my soul? Why in me so dismayed? Trust God, for I shall praise him yet. His countenance is my need. And that's the very word of Christ to us. God's word, not some exposition by man or some hymn by, by man but God's word they're so experimental a fourteenth reason is that many gifts are mentioned in the New Testament but never the gift of composing hymns or music we have, for example, the New Testament talks about the gift of prophecy, of teachers, of healing, of tongues, of interpretation of tongues, of helps, of governments, and so on. But there's no mention of the gift of poetry. No mention of the gift of music. Why? Because, of course, the New Testament use, the New Testament Christians used the Psalms and they sang them without accompanying music. Simple, could be used anywhere. Paul and Silas could sing these Psalms in prison. They didn't need an organ, they didn't need a guitar. All they had was the Psalms. And what a blessing these psalms were to them and what a witness to those in the prison in Philippi as Paul and Silas sang there with their feet in the stocks a fifteenth reason is that the psalms particularly glorify Christ they don't give glory to poets and songwriters or musical directors the glory all goes to God. God's songs. God gives them to us. To be sung simply to him. Not so as we would glory in our music. Or glory in our compositions. But give all glory to God. The psalms glorify God. They're God's psalms. And they're given to us to glorify him. A sixteenth reason is that the Psalms have a great depth and riches about them. They feed the soul as you sing them. And that's what we have here. Let the word of Christ dwell richly in you in teaching and admonishing one another in Psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. What do you find in modern churches? Mindless choruses repeating the same word over and over and over again. Love, 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 or happy, 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 or whatever it is. So often, superficial, childish choruses, 
or sentimental hymns. What we have in the Psalms is the rich, deep, thorough biblical teaching. So good for feeding our souls. So good for admonishing and instructing one another. The Psalms have a depth and a riches about them. A seventeenth reason is that when the churches move away from singing Psalms, what do you find? Do you find that they still sing some psalms along with their own hymns? No. You find that rarely do they sing psalms. Think of a hymn book commonly used in the Church of Scotland and many other churches. Mission Praise. How many psalms do you find in it? Two or three. The psalms are rejected because they think their own hymns are far better. Just the other day I was in a church service. It was a good service. It was the reading of God's word and solemn prayers, an excellent sermon preached. But there wasn't one psalm sung, four hymns. Why? Even if you misunderstand this verse as saying psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, you, you, as if these hymns and spiritual songs were, were modern hymns, well, surely you should sing ha- psalms as well. But instead you find when people move away from the psalms, they move away completely from them. And that is surely an insult to the God who composed these psalms and gave us the psalms to sing. An 18th reason is that the reformers, Calvin and Knox, the Puritans, the Presbyterians, the Westminster Fathers, Westminster Directory of Public Worship, They sang psalms, and only psalms, and believed it was wrong to sing anything else. We have that in the Westminster Directory of Public Worship. The best Christians are those who have sung the psalms and sing the psalms. A 19th reason is, when did the hymns come in in Scotland? They came in in the 1870s, 80s, 90s. They came in along with Moody and Sankey's Arminianism. They came in along with liberalism from Germany. The watering down, the weakening, the turning away from the solid teaching of scripture, turning away from the truth. As the churches in Scotland departed from the faith, The hymns and the music came in. And so finally, we cannot get better than the Psalms. God given praise. They're deeper, they're richer, they provide us with fuller worship. They are authored by Christ, they're about Christ, they're glorifying to God and glorifying to Christ. They teach us, they instruct us. We are to give God the very best. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another with the scriptures, with psalms, hymns, and songs of the Spirit, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. We're to treasure our psalms. Sad to see churches in Scotland departing from these things. Let us appreciate the psalms. Let us love the psalms. Let us sing them. Let us be blessed by the psalms. Let the word of Christ, the word of God, dwell in our hearts as we sing the psalms. 
to our own edification, to the edification of those who are in the congregation and to the glory of God. Whoever you are, whatever your background, come to Christ. Come to him and appreciate him. Put your faith in him. Look to Jesus. Ask Jesus to come into your heart. Let your heart be filled with the word of Christ. Love the scriptures. The Bible is unique. It's different from every other book. These Psalms are unique. Study the Psalms. Read them. Think about them. Sing them. And glorify God in your life. Let us pray. <coughs> Lord our God, we thank thee that thou hast not left us to compose our own songs for public worship, but thou hast given to us this wonderful manual of praise that has been such a blessing to thy church in Old Testament times, in New Testament times, again at the Reformation and down from the times of the Reformation, the Puritans and the Presbyterians, we think, Lord, of um, the blessing that these psalms have been in thy church. Help us to treasure them, to love them, to delight in them. Lead us into thy truth. Open our minds to the teachings of thy word. And may we love to give to thee the worship that thou dost desire and follow the pattern that thou hast laid down for us and give to God all the glory. May we be nothing, and may God be glorified. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Our closing praise is Psalm 95, and we'll sing verses 1 to 5. Psalm 95 at the beginning. Oh, come, let us sing to the Lord. Come, let us, everyone, a joyful noise make to the rock of our salvation. Let us before his presence come with praise and thankful voice. Let us sing psalms to him with grace and make a joyful noise. Psalm 95, 1 to 5. <clears throat> oh.